So uh, this is what got you here, that my student and I uh, had uh, significant power loss over Vancouver, Washington, which is a busy city with lots of buildings and no place to land uh, other than back at the at Pearson Field. So if you want to look at it on a chart while we're, you know, if you got a way to do that on the side while we're talking here, you can see the layout, but I'm going to show you charts anyway. So you don't need to do that necessarily. All right, so we talked a little bit how to get wings credit. I hope that's uh, sufficient. Uh, wrongs and rights, I'm going to confess as much as I uh, can uh, think of saying about what I did wrong. Uh, the few things I did right, which is why we're still talking. <laughs> and you didn't read about me, uh, front page news. Uh, talk a little bit about the NASA Aviation Safety Reporting System, NTSB reporting requirements, emergency procedures. Uh, loss of control, accelerated stall, CRM, threat and error management, and uh, even ANR headsets. So in some order, we're going to cover uh, all of those things. Let me tell you what this webinar is not. It is not a bash fill uh, opportunity because you, you and I all know what happens on social media. You post something and you get bashed. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to bash myself. So if you have any uh suggestions or constructive criticism uh why, why didn't i do this or did i consider that i really do want to hear it and the way to do that is to email me at phmand at gmail.com it's showing on your screen right now i would love to hear from you uh and it's also not a praise phil because uh if i'd really done everything right the incident would not have even happened all right, uh, so a little bit about me, because I always like to know who's talking to me. Uh, so 3,200 hours plus total time, about 2,000 as a flight instructor, FAA safety team representative, which is why I can offer uh, wings credit. And uh, so I really enjoy doing this. Uh, retired engineer and uh, owner, previous owner of nine airplanes and current owner of the 10th airplane shown here. It's my third T-18 this beautiful thing right here, and uh, I'm in love with her, Miss Thorpe. So uh, anyway, hope to give you a ride someday, perhaps. All right, here we go. Um, what is that? Uh, it's the processor for my cochlear implant, and I'm, I'm telling you this for a reason, not just so you'll feel sorry for me. <laughs> uh, so what it means is uh, I had an infarct similar to a stroke Oh, uh, going on four and a shave four and a half years ago or so, and it robbed me of my hearing in my left ear, hearing and balance. So uh, nowadays I wear a uh, cochlear implant almost all the time, like I am now. I don't know if you can see me in addition to the screen share, but it's uh, here attached to my left ear, and that's a magnet, and it talks to my auditory nerve. So it gives me the illusion of sound. Uh, when I did the flight that's in question here and, and all my previous flights since the infarct, uh, I would take this off because it's too uncomfortable under a headset and really just fly with one ear. And uh, I did well enough. I could hear uh, intercom. I could hear, you know, my passenger or passengers or student. I could hear uh, ATC well. I, I could do everything I needed to do. Uh, almost. So uh, once uh, this incident happened, uh, for reasons you'll hear in a little bit, uh, I decided I, I just have to improve the situation. I can't, I have to be able to hear the engine uh, at least during critical times of flight. So I happen to have a different version of this device. Let me stop screen share just so I can show you what's going on here. Uh, so this is the, the usual implant I wear all day because so, it's, it's relatively unobtrusive and sits comfortably. I also have a version that looks like this, just uh, hangs onto that magnet, um, just like the other one does, but it, it sits outside the headset. Imagine there's a headset ear cup like this, and this is now outside the headset, which means this will pick up engine noise. And of course, even through an A&R a, a headset, whether it's turned on or not, you'll at least hear some engine noise in, in your ears. Uh, so if you only get it at, in one side, though, you're only getting half or less of the actual information. So, uh, so 
things are way better once I figured that out and I figured out how to um, stream the airplane audio to it, the intercom and the uh, ATC. So I, I'm totally binaural now. Uh, so that's a very good thing, but uh, we're going to talk about hearing the engine uh, when we get to that slide. I want to give a quick shout out to the Flights Above uh, Network. Uh, they're kind enough to let me advertise on, on their website, in other words, promote these webinars. So check that out, and especially if you're on Facebook, find the uh, Flights Above your neighborhood, and uh, it's a good group, so, so uh, take a look at it. All right, under pressure, uh, this has often been credited to uh, a Navy SEAL, but uh, apparently it's uh, originally attributed to a Greek lyrical poet whose name I don't even know how to say. But here's the truth. Under pressure, you'd like to think that you rise to the level of the occasion. And uh, I'm here to tell you that if, if there's enough pressure, enough stress, if you are surprised beyond your ability to, to continue rational thinking, you don't. You do not rise to the level of the occasion. You sink to the level of your training. And I might add, you sink to the level of your training and whatever you've been practicing. So uh, practice, practice, practice. So in this case, uh, nothing teaches like teaching, or that's according to me, according to Aristotle, teaching is the highest form of understanding or teaching is the highest form of learning. And the reason I put that in, this is going to sound, uh, you know, self-centered, but it's not. So let me say it and then I'll explain. Uh, I honestly think that the reason I and my student survived this incident is that I'm a flight instructor. No, that doesn't mean I'm a better pilot than you. It means I teach these procedures all the time and teaching is the highest form of learning. So every time I teach emergency procedures, I am solidifying that in my own mind so that should it happen to me, like in this case, either total engine failure or partial engine failure, uh, I spring into action because it's, it's exactly what I've taught literally hundreds of times. Um, so I, you don't have to be an instructor to have this be automatic, though. All you got to do is practice. From the day I got my very first airplane, a 172, two weeks after I got my private certificate, back in 1981, I, I rarely fly without practicing emergency procedures, at least a power off landing, if nothing else. Almost always, unless I have a passenger and it would freak them out. But if I'm alone, just screwing around up there, I will make, uh, I, almost every time I fly, I'll do one or more uh, emergency landings because I you have to stay sharp on this stuff. Because when you need it, that's not the time to go, uh, what's the first thing I'm supposed to do? Oh, shoot, what do I, uh, it's been too long. <laughs> And, and don't count on flight reviews to remind you because uh, not everyone uh, requires emergency procedures and flight reviews. That's of course up to the individual uh, instructor doing the flight review. Uh, so, uh, so that's so practice, practice, pra please practice these procedures. So the stress response, you've always heard of uh, fight or flight uh, I was researching this, uh, and, you know, to, to develop this webinar and seminar. Uh, there are really three components. If you're stressed enough, fight, flight, or freeze, none of which are good responses in an airplane. If you're stressed enough, this is what happens. So the fight response, excuse me, if you assess uh, that it's something you potentially have the power to defeat, you go into fight mode and you could, you could say, oh, pardon me, I needed a drink, uh, that uh, you're fighting the airplane, but you know, really you need, you, it's not quite, you're flying, you're not fighting. Uh, so maybe that's a semantic difference, but, uh, but that's the fight response, you know, in nature, you'd be, you fight something if you think you can fight it. You'll flee if you don't think you'll be able to fight it. And there's nowhere to go unless you got a parachute and a way out of the darn thing. Uh, so, and freeze is definitely not a good response because then you're just not going to do anything and the airplane's going to go somewhere. <laughs> it's better if it goes somewhere that you direct it to. 
uh, uh, with some with some uh, with some purpose in mind. Uh, so the freeze response, uh, something called brain freeze, and this is very important. This comes from Kenneth Stahl, an MD and uh, part of the AOPA Pilot Protection Services uh, group. Brain freeze, tunnel vision, and task fixation are potential reactions to stress and are only a small part of a broader stress-related syndrome known as tunnel senses. So having been scared a number of times, not only in airplanes, but anywhere, uh, if you've ever been frightened enough, you might have noticed afterwards, once you get your wits about you again, that during the fright, during the emergency, you had tunnel vision. Your peripheral vision goes away. Even, sort of, so to speak, your peripheral hearing goes away. You become hyper-focused on what's right there in front of you. That your forebrain goes away, you have a frontal lobotomy, you don't think like you normally do, uh, and you, just, you become an animal. I mean, you're, you're, you're in tunnel sense land, you're in brain freeze. And uh, if you haven't experienced this, take my word for it, I hope you never experience it, but your, your rational brain goes away for some number of seconds uh, you know, until you, until you somehow manage to regain control of yourself. Uh, so, uh, so these, what, uh, Dr. Stahl continues to say is these factors add up to, uh, loss of situational awareness. When you are suffering from tunneled senses and your situational awareness and big picture perception are pretty much gone. Uh, I don't think I said that in correct English, but anyway, you get the idea. Your, your big picture perception, peripheral vision and peripheral hearing, gone, and you become an automaton. And, uh, and this is why you need practice, 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 so that your automaton actions will be such that uh, a better outcome will occur than, uh, than if you just succumb to the brain freeze. Uh, so... Uh, moving along, there's something uh, called threat and error management uh, that's been the talk of the town recently in FAA land, TEM, and um, uh, it goes a little bit like this. Uh, this is from the FAA BLAST uh, safety briefing uh, back in November of 2019. As pilots, we make dozens of decisions literally on the fly. We rely on our experience and resources to make good decisions and mitigate risks. But to be better risk managers, we need to know or anticipate what those risks are. And that's where threat and error management comes in. So generally speaking, threat is something that happens to you and error is something that happens by you or because of you. Uh, and one of the goals of threat and error management is to constantly be thinking about what potential threats are there and what am I going to do about them. Uh, so uh, I invite you to take a look at that. There's uh, uh, the article here, if you can reach this uh, web link down here, bit.ly slash FAA-TEM, B-I-T dot L-Y slash FAA-TEM, where you can learn more about that. And again, this comes from the November, December FAA safety uh, briefing. So you can find that online if you didn't get that uh, link. So it's about uh, making good decisions on the fly and, and anticipating threats, anticipating problems. Uh, I gotta skip a little bit just in the interest of time. Sometimes I do this as a 90 minute seminar, but I'm gonna jump around a little bit just to pack it into 60 minutes. All right, so the aircraft that this happened in it was a Beach Musketeer. Um, this is an example. This is not the exact airplane. Uh, if you didn't know any better, you'd think it's a Piper Cherokee, except that the wings and tail feathers aren't corrugated. It's kind of Beach's answer to a Cherokee Warrior. Uh, 150 or 160 horsepower, just depending on the model. Or in the case of the, the, the incident airplane, it was 145 horsepower fuel injected engine. This is kind of the interior. And again, this is just a stock photo. Uh, one thing I want you to notice here is the manual flaps. I don't know if you've ever flown with a Johnson bar like that. I happen to love them. 
more than uh, electric flaps because uh, you like jam, you know, snap it into place and you know where it is. You don't have to wait. But, uh, but there are other factors involved too, which we will get to later on in the webinar. So just remember this says manual flaps. This lever comes up in order to lower the flaps. Uh, so that's the interior. Again, it looks very much like a Cherokee warrior. So uh, I'm going to show you the full video and, uh, and we'll, we'll see it two or three times tonight. So the first one is just raw, no subtitles. Uh, so you get a chance to see what happened. And really all you're going to see is the aircraft taxi towards the runway, hold line, takes the runway, take off an initial climb. The stall buzzer is kind of busy. Then the engine noise changes dramatically. Aircraft turns sharply to the right, nose low, and you'll en briefly end up in that situation like the opening slide uh, and uh, pointed towards those buildings. And then the aircraft recovers and lands opposite direction on the runway. Uh, so here, this is the entirety of the flight. Here's Pearson Field, KVUO. Uh, PDX, Portland International, is just south of the river on this. Um, slide. I've zoomed way into Pearson, but PDX is just across the river and slightly east. So we took off. We crossed the, this freeway, which is Interstate 5. We went a little bit farther. The engine noise went to heck. And I, made a U I took control of the airplane from the student, made a U-turn to the right, and went back to the runway. That's, that's the entire flight. I think it was a mile and a half total. Uh, here it is on kind of the Google Maps view. And uh, we kind of turned around this, and this is all a bunch of buildings here that look like this. So imagine you're at 300 feet here, you lose at least half of your engine power and you have nowhere to go. And uh, I'm just lucky the engine hung in there long enough to get me back to the, to the runway. So uh, Pearson Field, uh, I'm gonna skip this again in the interest of time, it's just the, uh, has unusual communication procedures. But other than that, it's an uh, uncontrolled field. So there's runway 26. Uh, I'll see you in about uh, six minutes.
Alright, master off, mags off. Ooh. Get the airplane before we do anything else. Light out the hard way. It's gonna catch fire. Oh, be off. Yep. <sighs> That's exciting, huh? A little too exciting for me. Uh... So, um, let me recover from that for a, for a second. Uh, during that uh, turn back, uh, you saw uh, this scene briefly, and this was on the opening slide also. Uh, so I kind of took a freeze frame of the video uh, at what uh, what I best I could figure out was the worst possible point, which is uh, nose down, pointing at buildings. Um, so the when I took control of the airplane, once I figured out that something's really wrong, uh, we were at 300 feet on the altimeter and the uh, airport and uh, the ground there is just at 25 or 30 feet. It's barely above sea level. But you know, that's a bit misleading because uh, 300 feet AGL when there are 200 foot tall buildings is only effectively 100 feet of air. So obviously there are taller buildings and shorter buildings, and fortunately the tall ones got out of the way <laughs> during my turn back. But, uh, but what happened because of the tunnel vision, uh, tunnel senses that we talked about earlier, uh, we were in this uh, position right here, and I was pulling on the yoke, and nothing happened. And I pulled on the yoke some more. I had the thing nearly all the way out of the, out of the uh, panel, pulling on the yoke, and nothing's happening. And I'm like, I don't understand this. Uh, by this time, we figured out that we had lost all our oil. Um, the engine was running literally with zero oil. Incredible Continental engine kept running. Um, and uh, I spent some seconds, as I, it seemed like hours, but probably two or three seconds trying to figure out how could loss of oil, how could hot oil dribbling out of the engine cause the elevator to fail? And I, I just can't figure that out. So I'm thinking, well, then maybe I'm having two failures at the same time. We lost our oil, I'm having engine trouble, and the elevator failed. I'm uh, like, no, I can't believe I'm having two failures at the same time. Maybe it's something else. And I thought, okay, what could this be? Oh, this feels like an accelerated stall. If you have never been taught accelerated stalls, let me recommend you grab an instructor at your earliest opportunity and say, please take me up and show me accelerated stalls. It is not required for the private pilot check grade, so you privates may never have experienced it. The commercial and above, you have. Uh, go out and practice them <laughs> and remember how to get out of them. And uh, so uh, once I thought maybe this is an accelerated stall, my next thought was, how do you get out of an accelerated stall? Well, uh, you want to level wings and reduce back pressure. So I'm thinking level the wings. Okay, that takes ailerons. If I just use the ailerons uh, and I'm in a stall, the wings are stalled because I'm pulling the elevator and the nose is still down. That's in a stall. Uh, all I'm going to get is adverse yaw, uh, encouraging the airplane to spin if I use left aileron, the airplane is going to want to spin to the right. So I have to make sure I get this thing coordinated. And I have no idea how much rudder pressure to use in this configuration. So it's just going to be a wild guess. So I, 
I had no choice. I mean, it's either that or die. Look what's in front of me. So, uh, and I'm thinking, I, I, I'm not ready to die. My, my daughter just lost her mother a few years ago to cancer. This poor kid next to me is in his 20s. He's got his whole life ahead of him. He's somebody's son. He's somebody's brother. He's somebody's cousin. He's, I'm like, and then who am I going to kill on the ground? I can't let this happen. And all, I'm telling you, all these thoughts went through my head. Who's going to take care of my cats? You know, when, when you hear uh, um, your life flashes before your eyes, this, what I'm telling you is what happened. This is what happened. And in, in this, the fractions of a second that it takes to think about this stuff, obviously much faster than it takes to talk about, these were my thoughts. Uh, and, and so what I did was, what I'm going to tell you is the hardest thing for a pilot to do, the hardest thing in the universe for a pilot to do is to lower the nose, move the wheel forward, especially when the nose is pointed, I don't know, what is that, 20 degrees nose down? And you want me to move the wheel forward? Yes, that's the only way to, uh, to crawl out of a stall is to reduce the angle of attack. How do you do that? You relieve back pressure. You have no idea how difficult that is to do when the nose looks like this. Uh, and it's just all of the courage I could muster, uh, along with the thought that if I don't do, even if I don't do that, we're going to die and kill people on the ground. Uh, I take the risk when I go flying. My student takes the risk. Uh, the people on the ground didn't, didn't accept this risk. They don't deserve to die. So, you know, if I have to plow somewhere and, and the two of us are going to go, I can't, it's, I have no right to take anybody on the ground with us. Uh, I'll take a, a side note for one second. Someone asked, when did this happen? April of last year, April of 2019. Uh, so uh, so I, I very gingerly used the left aileron. I tried to just figure, just guess at how much rudder pressure to use with it, left rudder. I reduced back pressure, and of course, within a second and a half, the airplane's flying again. And I breathe the biggest sigh of relief you can imagine. Uh, and uh, once I had the airplane flying again, then uh, uh, I expanded my field of vision so I could see where, where do I need to go? Do I need to keep turning? Is it time to level the wings? So by, by this point, I was all I had to do was level the wings and then just avoid hitting anything. Uh, but, as you probably know, when you're stalled, you're in the highest possible drag situation for a wing to be in. It's, it's the, the only way to be higher drag is to put the flaps out. Uh, so I'd lost considerably more altitude than I would have if I had just not stalled in the first place. Uh, and that considerably more altitude might have been 50 feet, because look how little I had to work with. It doesn't take much extra altitude loss to uh, hit something hard. So uh, I thought, oh my gosh, I don't know if I'm going to make it with the engine running as it is. I'm going to cross my fingers and make one tiny little attempt to get a little bit of extra engine power. And fortunately, this throttle has the vernier where you can dial it instead of just push pull. And I gave it about a half turn to the right. I got probably 100 more RPM. I, I don't know what the RPM was because the RPM gauge is way over on the left. I'm in the right seat and I don't have time to look, but I could hear just a tiny bit more power. And I said, I'm just going to leave it right there. Sit on this until I get past all the buildings um, and then uh, deal with the rest of the landing. So accelerated stalls, please go out and, and get training in them. Don't just do it. If you've never done it, too many things can go wrong. Uh, but I encourage you to learn about them and, uh, and then practice. So uh, an accelerated stall, uh, I thought I'd do a little demo. Uh, this is my airplane, the Thorpe T-18, and uh, I had a photographer with me, and he was kind enough to take the airspeed indicator and stick it up here for us so we could see it. And you're going to see a straight-ahead, unaccelerated stall at right about 50 miles an hour. And then I'm going to crank it into a bank to the right. I'm going to try to mimic what happened in the Beechcraft. And we'll do a couple stalls there, and it's going to stall at about 60 or 61 miles an hour. All right, here we go.
All right, I hope you could uh, see the difference in airspeed there. Uh, the 50 mile an hour unaccelerated and uh, roughly 60 miles an hour accelerated. Um, so that's an accelerated stall. You can, and remember, you can, an airplane can be stalled at any attitude, at any airspeed. All right, so here are my confessions. Complacency, which uh, I learned recently is usually preceded by inattentiveness uh, during a critical phase of flight. This was a student I already knew fairly well. He had been trained by other instructors and then uh, I inherited him and he was very advanced, very, very capable student. I had had several flights with him already, so I was just sitting there waiting for him to do his thing and get off the ground and, and thinking about what we're going to do when we get to the practice area. So I was nowhere near paying as much attention as I should have um, during this phase of flight. Uh, I talked about my auditory issues, the single-sided deafness, and the, uh, the improvement I made on my cochlear implant side. But uh, a lot of people using uh, ANC or ANR headsets, the automatic noise canceling headsets, uh, and we love them because when you push that button, what happens? Uh, the noise goes away. You get robbed of hearing the engine noise. You are robbed of hearing the engine noise during a critical phase of flight. If I had, when I show the video again, notice how much, how many, probably a good 30 seconds before I took control, the engine noise was already changing. I didn't know that in the airplane. I only knew it once I saw the video and thought, really? There was that much chatter in the engine that long before I finally woke up? And the answer is yes, but I couldn't hear it because I only had one ear working at the time and I already had my ANR turned on. So I'm like, the, the airplane's as quiet as can be to my ear. And uh, I didn't realize there was a problem until it was so gosh darn obvious I couldn't ignore it anymore. So uh, I did this at a, a live webinar. Remember live, live seminar, excuse me. Remember live seminars? <laughs> Uh, and someone raised their hand and said, he makes a practice of leaving the ANR off, just use it as a passive headset until at least a thousand feet after takeoff. I thought that's brilliant. I mean, you know, I paid 850 bucks for this thing. I want the ANR, but I also want to hear the engine first. Then I'll turn on the ANR. So I invite you to consider that. Leave the darn thing off until you're safe enough that that you can, uh, you know where you're gonna go if you lose the engine and you have time to think about it. So along with complacency and inattentiveness, failure, uh, failure to have a plan in case of power loss, every second of the way during this critical of a phase of flight, uh, you need to know what you're going to do. Because once the emergency happens, remember what we talked about earlier, you get tunnel senses and you have a lobotomy. You can't think. You need to know in advance what you're going to do. Uh, so people often ask, why did you make a right turn when there was lower stuff to the left, specifically um, a river? Darn good question. I will uh, answer part of that now and part of that when I show you the layout of uh, Pearson Field and the uh, Columbia River. Uh, part of it is I'm sitting on the right side of the airplane. It's just easier for me to turn that way and see that way. Uh, but the other part is we had already started turning right because of the anatomy of the river, which you'll see when we get uh, a few slides further down. Odor. Uh, you can't tell from the video, but uh, a few seconds after takeoff, my student and I both noticed a fairly strong odor. And that we couldn't identify. It did not smell like burning oil, which is weird. I know what burning oil smells like, that, you know, a lot of these old airplanes leak, drip and drop, and you kind of know what hot oil smells like. Uh, it smelled more like jet exhaust, and, and my students said, well, there's, there's jets departing PDX right, on, right above us, and it's probably just jet exhaust because the wind is from the west, the wind is blowing it towards us. So I thought, okay, uh, so it kind of dismissed that order a little bit too easily. Uh, as I said, I failed to notice the engine change, the engine sound change early because of the factors I talked about earlier. Obviously banked too steeply or at least banked too steeply with too much back pressure at the same time. 
And that's what causes an accelerated stall in this case. Uh, so same thing here, excessive back pressure, accelerated stall. Uh, and then that's the flying part of it. And then after landing, uh, I should have had the student turn the fuel valve off in case there is a fire, firewall forward. You don't want to feed all 48 gallons in those massive tanks uh, and feed the fire. So I should have had him turn the fuel valve off as soon as we were safely on the ground. And then the flaps, remember that flap handle? When, that, when the flaps are down, that handle is up. I can get out, but he can't. So if there's a fire, I'm gone and he starts to turn and his leg gets stuck in the flap handle. And now he's got to figure out why can't I move? What's going on? Oh, what's this flap handle doing in the way? So big error on my feel terrible about that, that I, I inadvertently had him trapped. Nothing happened obviously, but if it had, it's insane. So I should have had fuel valve off and flaps up, uh, flaps up after landing. So canceling the emergency is a separate issue I'm going to leave out. So what else you can tell me when, uh, when you e email me and uh, uh, we'll talk about the stalls horn in a minute, Mark. Um, and uh, yeah, email me if you think there are other things that I should have thought of. Dang it, we're getting close to the hour and uh, this is why I make it a 90 minute seminar. I can't, I can't get this all in. I'm sorry if we go a little bit long. Uh, so what I did right, oh my gosh, I did some things right. <laughs> Once I finally was convinced that we got a problem, immediately took control of the aircraft. Uh, my student had already been well-trained and I always practice with everyone, positive exchange of flight controls. I have the aircraft, you have the aircraft, I have the aircraft. It takes three utterances to exchange control of the aircraft. So that way I know he's let go, I'm in charge, he knows I'm in charge. He doesn't have to do anything except now just respond to my request for communication or whatever. And, and he did fantastic as my co-pilot from that point forward. <clears throat> Excuse me. So please make sure you learn and always use positive exchange of flight controls, even if it feels silly. When you need it, it doesn't feel silly. <laughs> it's a godsend. All right, what went right? I assessed the engine power and tried different throttle settings. So. Most, if not all, uh, emergency checklists in, in POHs and airplane flight manuals say, if you lose the engine, go throttle full open. Uh, okay, uh, maybe that'll work. In this case, the throttle was already full open because we were in initial climb. Fortunately, my primary instructor, they are so important to us, I'm, I'm sure you know that already, uh, way back in 1981, he always taught me that if there's engine trouble, try a different throttle setting. Don't just be an automaton and go to full throttle because the engine may not like it. Try a different throttle setting. And in this case, just pulling it back a little bit gave me more RPM. If you listen carefully when I run it again with subtitles, uh, you might hear it. It gets really, really awful. And then it gets slightly less awful. And um, uh, and that's because I pulled the throttle back. And my thinking was, all right, it appears we lost oil. We could see, you can't see it in the video, but we saw uh, oil, we saw smoke coming out of the cowling. That explained the odor. Okay, this is definitely hot oil, even though it didn't smell like it. We're losing our oil. The engine sounds like heck. We got a problem. So full throttle, trying to get all 145 horses working, uh, on this engine, when there's no oil, the thing is just going to pound itself to bits. Maybe it'll run a little bit longer if I throttle back and don't demand so much of it. And that worked. Uh, so try a different throttle setting, try a different mixture setting, try a different carb heat setting if you have it. Um, and uh, uh, that's important to keep in mind. So uh, I made a plan immediately. I got, grabbed the airplane, found out that I could keep the engine running, at least for the moment, with a partial power setting, and then immediately turn back towards the runway, the, the shortest way back towards the runway, which is to the right. Uh, so what went wrong? I finally, fortunately, did recognize and recover from the accelerated stall before it was too late, and I flew the plane. 
Uh, we had great cockpit resource management, as I said. The student did everything I asked of him, which you'll see when we do the video again. And anything else you can think of, uh, email me. <laughs> I got to move along here to try to get you out of here. So now we're going to watch the uh, subtitled video. So you'll hear, you'll be able to read our communication uh, pretty well, I hope. And, um, and then I'll come back. Oops. Mags off. Oh, 
cool. Get the airplane before we do anything else. Light out the hard way. This is gonna catch fire. Okay, my leg. Should be off. Yep. Uh, um. Yeah. And uh, and the stall buzzer also. You know, it's done that before. It's not a screamer of an airplane. It's 145 horses. We were close to as heavy as could be. He had just filled the tanks and it holds like 48 gallons. He's kind of a big boy. I'm, you know, my size. And uh, it's, it beeps. <laughs> so he kept it shallow. He didn't, he didn't, wasn't, you know, didn't yield to temptation and raise the nose unnecessarily. You know, all you can do is, uh, is fly at best rate and raising the nose will make it climb any faster. So he did great. Um, uh, I did consider aborting the takeoff while it was beeping, but I, you know, we'd flown this airplane several times. It always chirps because um, it's just, uh, it's only 105, 145 horses on a, on a four place aircraft. So yeah, well, of course, in retrospect, if I had aborted uh, the takeoff, uh, we wouldn't have a webinar. Okay, that's silly. Uh, what caused the loss of oil? Um, so that's a really good question. Uh, the only thing I can say is uh, that there was uh, an unapproved modification made some owner ago or owners prior to these folks' possession, um, and that may have been the cause. So as long as your aircraft are maintained normally and that nobody does just invent some modification to something, uh, you'll be fine. So uh, that we don't know because the airplane flew at least 45 hours since these folks bought it. With that modification having happened, we don't know how many months or years ago. Uh, so, but that may have been the issue. And, um, but uh, regardless of that, the purpose of this webinar, of course, is the how do you handle uh, engine failure of any degree, you know, even if you don't know what it is. I mean, knowing that there was an oil issue, even if I didn't know, it could have been a magneto issue. It could have been, uh, so, you know, a valve that just swallowed a valve. I, you know, I, we only guessed that it's oil because of the smoke billowing and so on. But no matter what it is, you still got to fly the airplane. You'll find out what it is later if you make it back to the ground. So I hope that helps. All right. So uh, engine failure checklist. Uh, Every POH or AFM you read it has it in a different order, and it's not always easy easy to memorize, and it's not always in a logical sequence. What my instrument instructor taught me way back, probably 1982, uh, he taught me the letters of the alphabet, specifically A, B, C, D, and E, and then I added F. So what's the first thing you've got to do when you lose power? Preserve your altitude as best you can. Make it last as long as possible. How do you do that? Best glide speed, or at least find an attitude that you're going to estimate is going to give you uh, the, something close to the best possible uh, glide. So A for airspeed or attitude. B is begin to head for a place to land. So I grabbed the airplane, I tested the throttle, I got the little power surge that I had hoped for. Uh, I kept the pitch relatively level, which is best glide usually in single engine airplanes like that. And then I immediately, and then B, I headed for my place to land, which is behind me. Uh, the only possibility anywhere near Vancouver. Um, and that was the shortest distance back because we are already probably 20 degrees to the right because of the river. So turning around to the left would have taken longer. So uh, airspeed or attitude, begin to head for a place to land. C is the cockpit check, and he taught me to just go uh, upside down question mark. So uh, we, I didn't do any of this because A, I didn't have time, and B, I already surmised that we lost oil. So what good is it going to do to check the fuel valve? 
But uh, in general, start on the floor, which is usually where the fuel valve is. Make sure it's on something intelligent. And then go right to left. Flaps up if you have them down. Get rid of the drag. Play with the mixture. Throttle. Carb heat if you got it. Uh, mags. Uh, primer is usually in here someplace. So uh, ABC. Airspeed. Begin to head for a place to land. Cockpit check. If you have time. If you have time. If you have time. Declare. Right, you're flying the airplane first. If you have time, declare. 7700 usually happens pretty quickly on a transponder. Uh, transmit on some useful frequency if you uh, uh, have the time. If you have time, <laughs> all right? Don't stop flying the airplane just to declare. Fly the plane. If you have time, I think I've made my point. All right, so that's A, B, C, D. Uh, and then E, uh, if you have time, sometimes prior to uh, impact, if you're gonna impact, uh, notice what I did on the video, I asked them to unlatch the door. Why? Because if we hit something and the airplane, airplane bends, it may not be possible to unlatch the door. So someone comes, try to rescue us, can't get us out, and we have to wait for the jaws of life to show up. So, uh, and especially on, a, on this airplane, like a Cherokee, it's got the latch at the top and then the other latch that's down where, the, where our car handle would be. And uh, so once that's unlatched, even if we end up a little bit bent, the door's already partway open. Someone can just stick their fingers in and yank it open the rest of the way, hopefully. Uh, so other things you might wanna do for egress. If you're actually gonna land off field and you think you're gonna really break things, turn the fuel valve off before that happens so you can limit any post-impact fire, things like that. So egress. So airspeed or attitude, begin to head for a place to land, cockpit check, declare if you have time, prepare for egress if you have time. What's F? Fly the plane. A, B, C, D, E, F. And since you should always be flying the plane, I actually think Instead of A, B, C, D, E, F, it should be F, A, B, C, D, E. So there's a uh, emergency checklist you can, uh, you can adopt if you like it. Uh, so we're winding down. We've done it a few minutes here. Uh, NTSB. Uh, I talked to my student about the NTSB Part 830, about uh, reporting after accidents or incidents. And so I thought, well, let's at least make this a teachable moment since we can't go out and do stalls and steep turns. So uh, I looked up the regs uh, and it said uh, accident, uh, you know, substantial damage and so on, or a few other things, or a flight control system malfunction or failure. I said, well, we had an engine partial failure. It's not a flight control system. He said, what? Of course the engine is a flight control system. I said, no, it's not an aileron. It's not a rudder. It's a, uh, I think we need to report. So we called them. I looked up the phone number, called the office happens to be a Seattle number and said, hey, this just happened. Do I need to tell you? And the nice lady said, uh, did anybody get hurt? Nope. Did, any, did you bend any metal? Nope. Thanks for calling. Have a nice day. No need to report engine issues uh, if it doesn't re re result in substantial damage or bodily injury. Uh, so part 830. Uh, okay, so let me uh, review with you, if I, if I may, the uh, departure path at Pearson. So this yellow blob way down here in the lower right is the runway. And uh, notice how the river kind of makes you want to curve to the right. Plus PDX uh, class Charlie airspace starts right at the shoreline. And um, so the habit is, well, I'm about this far, the white line here heading to the west. I'm about this far from the river. It kind of feels like I should stay that far from the river. So we and everyone else tends to, to nudge to the right uh, shortly after takeoff. Well, uh, of course that works, but it takes you farther away from the lowest, you know, terrain, which is the river. And now you've got to, you got to pass a bunch of buildings. It's going to, it's going to take some distance and some time. Uh, to get to the river. And keep in mind, you can survive 
a water landing, you cannot survive a building landing. So given that choice, land in the water, do the best you can, tread, you know, <laughs> to wait and wait for a lifeboat to come get you. But, uh, but if you slam into a building, you're done. So uh, better to go for the water than, uh, than, than nowhere. Uh, so that's my proposal for Pearson and think about it anywhere that you happen to fly. So here I'm showing it again in different versions, different ways to look at it. And so here's that Portland class Charlie airspace. So all you got to do is stay north of Charlie. So you can get closer to the river uh, than you think. You just got to, uh, you just got to, you know, give yourself a few hundred yards from Charlie. You don't have to be a mile for away from it. You only have to be away from it. Um, so that's what it looks like on a sectional chart. Okay. So here's what we talked about. Uh, the wings credit, of course, what I did wrong or right. Uh, the aviation safety reporting system I didn't talk about. Um, so uh, in part of the, uh, after this flight briefing, I said, hey, let's uh, put this in the system because uh, it might be useful for other pilots and also for me personally, since I'm pilot command, if uh, someone complains and the FAA inspector, you know, says, hey, what happened? And um, we're not sure you did everything you should have done. Uh, the uh, filing an ASRS report in a timely manner can get you out of jail free. So I said, well, as long as I'm going to do it, why don't you do one of your own in your own words? And I set him up on one computer and I was in a different room on a different computer and we both filed reports. Um, so I encourage you to uh, look at that. Anyway, uh, I talked about NTSB, uh, emergency procedures, loss of control, accelerated stall, cockpit resource management, threat and error management in our headsets. Uh, I and all the other FAA safety team reps do this for free uh, because uh, we love teaching and we wanna share uh, as much as we can to help the pilot community takes a lot of time to do this, hours of uh, prep to get it myself organized for you. And I still have at least an hour's worth of work to do to give you wings credit. So if you think I earned a cup of coffee, <laughs> uh, just, uh, it's just a suggestion. Uh, buy me a cup of coffee, excuse me, buy me a coffee slash Phil M if you think I've earned it. Uh, so uh, I have time. So if you wanna shoot a question or two to me, uh, I'll, I'll wait a few seconds here, but um, I, you know, I've missed the live webinar seminars. I'm so used to saying webinar, <laughs> the live seminars uh, when you could just raise your hand and we could just interact. And uh, I, I hope we get back there soon. Um, all right, we got a comment here. Let's see. Uh, yeah, so you have to. So Paul says uh, on those takeoffs from runway two six at Pearson you're constrained below 700 feet because uh, that's what Pearson advisory tells you because of, of wake turbulence from those departing jets. Uh, so, so, so that even argues, I think, more strongly for staying close to the water without violating the Charlie airspace because you're only, you only allow, you only get 700 feet until you're well outside of the, um, of that area and you're no longer in danger of wake turbulence from the jets. Um, so yeah, thank you, Paul. That's a good point. Uh, it's, it's all, some of this is really unique to Pearson. So uh, anyway, uh, thank you so much for being here. P-H-M-A-N-D at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. And so uh, again, I appreciate your attendance and participation. Uh, look forward to hearing from you if you have anything to share. And uh, we'll see you again. All right. Thanks a lot. Fly safe.